Good morning, warm welcome to all of you to session 7.1. We'll be discussing the connection of basic sciences with energy technologies, climate action and protection of the environment. And I think this promises to be exceedingly interesting session. We have four very eminent speakers and I think four topics. At surface they need to be, they appear to be separate, but they're actually in a deeper sense they're connected because the first two speakers will address the question of the, of the advanced future energy supply technologies that would have zero emissions and low environmental impact. Uh, then we'll be talking about how to measure and monitor the air, pollutions in a very, air pollution in a very innovative way. And then we'll conclude with a remote talk on the conservation and protection of the nature. So I think that all falls very well together. Uh, I will be very quick because I think we have to move straight to the speakers. That's why I've asked them to sit here on the panel uh, because we'll, we'll have to shorten the session to 95 minutes and there is a lot to discuss. So uh, what I would like to do is give the floor to each speaker and then allow a couple of minutes for direct questions to each of the speakers. And then if you have time at the end, we'll go to the general discussion. That would be the plan, and of course, I would like to ask the speakers to stick to their 20 minutes. Please, I know how difficult it is. I will give you a five-minute warning, and then I will use this. Just that you know when the 20 <laughs> minutes are over. I didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need it to use you it. You don't need it. <laughs> the tickets are very good. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> Just in case. For your Just sake. in case. Yeah. In any case, uh, I, I, no, no further ado, I would like to start and give the floor to the first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Dragan uh, Dragoslav Ciric. Uh, he is the uh, Tokama Cooperations Manager in the UK at the Atomic Energy Authority. has 40 years experience in experimental physics. And maybe I just mentioned at the end, you started your career here in Vincha in Belgrade. And I yes, think that's I'm very significant. I myself as well. Yeah, so please take the floor. Well, it's a pleasure, in fact, to be back in the city in which I was born and grew up. And uh, I'd like to thank Nebojša, my good friend, which I appear to know for about 54 years, minus 10 days, I think. When we started studying on the Faculty of Electrical Engineering uh, at the Department of Applied Physics. And then a few years after, in fact, we actually prepare most of the exams together and it was a tough competition who's going to get a better mark. After that, in fact, we worked together in the same laboratory and shared the office for about 10 years or slightly more. And uh, then our paths just went into different direction. Nebojša decided to fight with Serbian government and I decided to go abroad. That much about history of our friendship. And now I'll just go to the history of fusion, in fact, and the current status of it. So, I mean, we need definitely clean energy production. Everybody agrees that it has to be safe, it has to be sustainable, and of course it shouldn't contribute to the climate change. And fusion fulfills uh, probably all of these requirements. Out of the four, I would say probably about three and a half, something like that. And it's based on the physical process that powers the sun and the stars. Uh, and it's the most popular uh, nuclear reaction in the universe. So I was thinking, in fact, how to make, make this talk and thinking about the, well, diversity of skills in this audience. I thought it should be really popular because not everybody around is physicist. So I'll go through the reaction and then speak a bit about magnetically confined fusion because there are other methods to, to actually reach it, but I'm not going to talk about these. Uh, talk a little bit about history of fusion and its achievement and with the emphasis on JET, the machine on which I worked for the last 30 years, and uh, uh, spend some time on current and future developments, which are a machine which is being built at the south in France, ITER, and the future machine, which is DEMO, and of course finish with some conclusion. So. Fusion occurs when two nuclei of uh, hydrogen isotope, the deuterium and the tritium collide, uh, create an unstable nuclei, which then disintegrates into helium and neutron. And of course, some energy is released. And uh, that energy, of course, comes from the difference in the masses of the incoming particles in outgoing particles. And then if we 
ask Einstein for help. We actually get that it's about 17.6 mega electron volts. About 80% uh, goes uh, with neutron and about 20% uh, goes with uh, helium or alpha particle. And both of these uh, particles, in fact, uh, has their role in fusion. Neutron is basically uh, an, a source of energy and uh, alpha particle is actually a source of heat for the plasma. Uh, neutrons, of course, can be used in a relatively conventional way because once neutrons are passing through, through matter, they will well, transfer its, its en energy, which uh, at the end is going to be uh, well, transferred into heat. And once you get heat, then you can use conventional method, in fact, to pr produce electricity by using a heat exchanger and then uh, produce some steam. And then you have a turbine and you have electrical generators. So the rest is actually relatively simple. So the issue with fusion is that you have positively charged particles, D plus and T plus, and they of course repel each other because of Coulomb forces. Uh, so they need some energy, in fact, or uh, they had, need to have relatively high energy. Uh, in plasma physics, we often talk about temperature uh, to fuse. Uh, but apart from uh, energy, you also need certain particle density. And you also need a certain value of so-called energy confinement time, which is a measure of how quickly, in fact, you lose fusion power to the environment. Uh, each of these quantities are actually measurable directly, which is quite nice, and all have to be uh, in a certain range. But the important one is, in fact, the product of the three, which is called fusion triple product. And uh, to achieve the sustained fusion, basically, which is burning on, on itself, uh, you, it has to have a certain value of that so-called Lawson criterion. In the sun and uh, in the stars, uh, high particle density is achieved uh, by gravitational forces because stars and suns are so big. And the fusion is sustained in temperature about 15 million degrees C. To achieve the same condition on Earth, of course, you need considerably higher temperature uh, to compensate for lower density. And we are talking about typical temperatures of about 150 million degrees C. So uh, fusion on Earth actually is hotter than fusion in the universe. And these conditions can be reached in so-called high temperature plasma, confined in a, a vacuum chamber with high magnetic fields. Uh, plasma is used many times in different fields, but plasma which I'm talking about is in fact, when you put heat into solid, you get liquid, when you put heat into liquid, you get gas, when you put more heat into gas, you actually get plasma with, well, uh, practically, you have a, well, neutral fu fluid, uh, fluid, uh, fluid of, uh, uh, well, completely, fully ionized atoms and electrons, which is actually uh, electrically neutral because there is an equal number of each. Uh, the device which I'm going to talk about is the tokamak which is a Russian acronym, uh, which means basically toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. And this is the simplest way of presenting it. Uh, Tokamak works uh, like a transformer. In the center, you have this so-called central solenoid with uh, tens of thousands of amps, which are flowing through many, many turns. And the plasma itself, which is shown of the, here in pink, is actually a secondary mm, the transformer circuit and it's only one turn, so you're dealing with millions of amps. <clears throat> to confine it within the vacuum chamber, which I didn't show here, otherwise nothing will be visible, <clears throat> you use the roidal field to form the plasma in the shape of donut and uh, to, well, control the position of the plasma and also, in fact, to get the proper uh, field uh, which uh, has good confinement, use this so-called poloidal coils, and a result you get <coughs> resultant helical magnetic field lines, which uh, are invented basically in Russia, and then uh, positive and uh, negative uh, uh, ions and electrons, of course, gyrate around, around these lines, and they are trapped in the plasma. So to get plasma, you put some gas into the chamber, and then you strike, uh, well, put well, high current through the central solenoid, and of course that will create an electrical field within the plasma, 
within the chamber uh, and it, uh, you will get some ionization of the gas and that's how you actually create it. But then you have to heat it to high temperature. And the first one is so-called ohmic heating because plasma has resistance. Uh, electrons and ions move in, op is op in opposite direction and that's, in fact, there is a res resistance to that movement. But that's not enough. It's okay only really for relatively low temperatures. So you need to use other methods. And one of them is neutral beam injection heating. When you uh, inject into the tokamak uh, neutral particles of deuterium and tritium in, in the relatively wide energy range. And then they get ionized in the plasma, uh, collide, well, simple col column collision in the plasma, and they transfer their energy to plasma particles. Or you can use waves, either in a radio frequency range or in the microwaves, this so-called ion cyclotron resonance heating and electron cyclotron resonance heating. And as I mentioned earlier, in fact, there is also alpha heating. So in case, in fact, you start to produce fusion at relatively uh, high performance, uh, alpha particles are positively charged. They are also trapped in the, in, the, in the magnetic field, so they will collide with plasma particles and in principle heat it up. And uh, at some point you can get to the conditions that uh, you can actually switch off additional heating and plasma will burn on itself. And that's what's happening on the sun. Uh, so why we want to use fusion? I mean, it has little or no environmental impact. It does have some environmental impact because wherever you have neutrons, of course, you will have activation, but it's considerably lower than the one produced by fission uh, and it can be controlled by the use of materials and you will actually never uh, have uh, isotopes which are going to live for hundreds and thousands or millions of years. Uh, there is no risk of crit critical events. Uh, it's very hard, in fact, to keep plasma going. So the, and the thing like nuclear reactor meltdown simply doesn't exist. It is using an extremely small amount of fuel, in fact, produce loads of energy and one kilogram of fusion fuel and that's deuterium and tritium uh, will produce about 100 million kilowatt hours of energy and will provide requirements for, for a gigawatt electrical power plant for a day. And the last thing is that actually it's sustainable because fusion fuel is abundant and uh, the first one of course deuterium is a natural hydrogen isotope which exists in nature. It's all produced at industrial scale already for years. Uh, there is about 33 grams of tritium in a cubic meter of seawater. Uh, tritium, un unfortunately, exists only in traces, or fortunately, because it's radioactive. And nowadays, it's only produced in heavy water nuclear reactors. And the annual lead production is only about 20 kilograms, which is probably OK to run ITER for the next 10, 15 years, but almost certainly not enough. <laughs> For the, for the future power plants. But fortunately, <clears throat> nature can help again with another nuclear reaction because, uh, and that's by putting a breather blanket, basically, instead of uh, covering the wall with a special material, and you use lithium. Uh, there are two reactions which actually produce tritium. The, the, the top one with lithium-6 has considerably high cross-section. And in principle, you can produce uh, more tritium in the fusion reactor than you actually use to run it, the so-called uh, uh, tritium breeder ratio. Uh, now, lithium is not going to be used only by fusion in the future because we all have laptops and uh, mobile phones and tablets. But the proven reserves are about 50 million tons, which means that there are about 3 million tons of lithium, the six. But it also exists in, uh, uh, in seawater in very low concentration, about 0.1 part per million, which is definitely not economical at the moment, but who knows what's going to be happening in the future. And if you take that one into account, you have about 250 billion tons. And then estimated requirement, in fact, for a gigawatt electrical power station is about 500 kilograms per year, which is actually not that much. So in fusion, you're talking about kilograms, you're not talking about tons. Uh, brief history. Fusion is known only for about 100 years, in fact, when Cambridge astrophysicist started with Eddington actually proposed it in his paper. At that time, in fact, it was not clear, in fact, what is powering the stars. Uh, old Greek assumed that it was the molten metal, which definitely was not the case. 
And unfortunately, as it's, it's often, very often the case, the first uh, application of fusion was quite destructive, and that was the thermonuclear weapon of hydrogen bomb in the United States in 52, and then in some other countries. But fortunately, uh, at the same time, physicists started to think how actually to use that power, uh, uh, that process, in fact, to potentially have an unlimited source of energy. And for many years, in fact, fusion is called as a holy grail of physics because we were chasing it up for many years. In 1940s and 50s, several devices were, uh, which were based on ma magnetic confinement were built, but they suffered of various plasma uh, instabilities and basically it was not possible to get any sustained operation. The real breakthrough happened in uh, Russia, in Kurchatov Institute, uh, around end of 60s, with the Tokamak T3, which was constructed under the leadership of uh, Lev Vertsimovich, uh, often referred to as father of fusion. And this device produced the first really quasi-stationary quasi fusion reaction with temperatures 10 times higher than any other, than any other device previously. Uh, as you remember, that was the time of the Cold War. So the West was actually quite suspicious. They didn't believe that they, the, the Russians actually achieved that because it was, the temperature was measured indirectly. It was not direct measurement. So uh, Russian scientists decided then to call the UK scientists, some plasma spectroscopies from Column Laboratory, to measure it directly using Thomson scattering. And the result was that uh, uh, it was proven that the temperature was really that high. And the consequence was that after that, tokamak started to appear like mushrooms, and more than 100 devices were actually built and operated so far. Uh, but most of them are actually using hydrogen on the ethereum because you can learn a lot of, about plasma physics because, uh, before you actually get to the real fusion production. Uh, the biggest one of these is JET or Joint European Taurus, uh, which is still the large, uh, largest uh, tokamak in operation and it was built jointly by, and operated jointly uh, still now by the countries of the European Union. The decision was made in 1971 uh, and the international design team was then established two years after in 1973 in Kalim Laboratory. And note that if you, some of you remember that that was at the time when, sorry? Five, five more minutes. Yeah. Oh my God, this is horrible. Skip it. Uh, few words about JET then. So the, it's the only tokamak which is actually using deuterium and tritium, apart from the one in, TF, in the States, which actually stopped operation quite a while ago. And it's not the machine which was supposed to produce uh, electricity. It's uh, running with the conventional copper coils and it, uh, it runs only pulses of about five to 20 seconds. Uh, the main thing was, in fact, uh, the scientific goal was to uh, demonstrate the break-even, and that's the so-called fusion energy gain factor of Q uh, equals 1, and that's the ratio between the generated fusion power and the plasma heating power. So this is JET in Column Science Center, and this one is encircled there, and the machine itself looks like this, except you really can't see much here. It's about 2,600 tons of metals and, and different materials. How it really looks like, you actually see on this picture, and there is a human reference. The thing on the left side is actually jet tokamak. The thing on the right in blue is one of the neutralium heating systems, and the parameters of the machine actually are given in this table. And this is how the machine actually looks inside. Now it is actually quite complicated. In the past, it was much simpler. So JET operated now for about 40 years, and the major change in configuration was uh, about uh, uh, 10 years ago when we actually changed the entire machine, in, well, inside of the machine to replicate uh, uh, JET successor ITER. And we did experiments uh, first time in 1991, then in 1997, which was quite extensive, and then in the last year, in fact, just around December and didn't achieve the ultimate goal, of course, unfortunately, but that's life. I mean, this chart shows those records achieved by uh, JET in DT operation. The, the spiky one is the highest one ever achieved in magnetic fusion, which was QDT around 0.67. And the others, in fact, represent stationary modes, 
which we achieved in 97 and recently. Uh, how the, the whole thing actually looks like, something like this. This is the pulse of the record that pulse that we made on 21st December last year. And now you put the heat into the system, it's actually quite nice. It's plasma. Sorry, this is always the problem. How do I go back? This graph you probably have seen, in fact, summarizes the whole thing, the whole history of fusion, uh, starting for the T3 tokamak at the very bottom, and it shows the fusion product uh, versus central ion temperature. And we managed to increase that value for, by about four, four orders of magnitude since then, and most very high results are uh, obtained with large machines. Uh, those curves, in fact, uh, shows one of them shows the break-even, which is this one here, and this one shows the ignition, and the future machine, ITER, is going to operate here. ITER is International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, and to get the idea how big it is, I mean, again, there are some reference humans to give you an idea about the whole site, and the parameters are here. Plasma is considerably bigger, current is considerably bigger, and the pulse length is considerably bigger. I'll skip the history. I should probably only, only men, uh, mention that uh, uh, originally it was started by European Union, Japan, USSR, and USA, and then later on China and South Korea joined, and after that India and that uh, the <coughs> construction is actually now in place and this design was happening in fact in the, quite a few years before that. And that's the ITER site, how it looks like now, it's considerably bigger. The machine itself is in this about 60 meter tall building and next to it is the assembly hall or if you look on the other side, uh, you can see, in fact, quite a long building of 250 meters length in which, in fact, poloidal coals were built. To get the idea about the size, this is one ninth of the ether chamber, and you can see uh, accidental passerby, just to have some idea about the size. The components are actually put together in the assembly hall, which is the size of a football pitch. Then they are moved into the tokamak area, and finally you can see one vacuum sector actually installed. And looking at what ITER has to achieve, that's the produced gain factor of 5 in a steady state and, trans and a transient of about uh, 10, and also to verify tritium breathing co concept and to verify quite a few other things. And the main thing is also to build technical organization, or logistical skills, capability skills and tools for future machines. And our demo is actually a generic one, one minute. You can say a few words about them. It is a generic name. Uh, it's only really a concept at the moment, and there is not only one. One is actually uh, built in, uh, well, designed in Europe. There is also one in Japan. There is one in China. There is one in Korea. Uh, there is one in UKEA, which is called Spherical Tokamak, Step or Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. Uh, most of them are actually quite big. But U.S., they think that, in fact, it's too expensive to deal with that, and uh, they are uh, favoring, in fact, smaller machines because they can attract uh, industry and uh, investors. So if you look at the path, this is how it looks like, and this is where our U.K. program sits. I didn't ma mention about cost. Uh, it is quite expensive. It's not only complex, but also e e expensive. But when you compare it to other things, I think it's relatively cheap. In fact, sending people to Mars will be probably about 60 billion. And a football World Cup in Qatar is actually about 200. And I wouldn't mention the annual defense budget on some of the countries. So at the end, that's my conclusion. I leave it to you to read it. I think I hopefully convinced you that we made some progress, but we are not there yet. So that's it. <laughs> Let's thank Dragoslav for the overview. I almost have a tendency to talk a bit more than actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, so way. many decades of progress <laughs> in few minutes so is not easy. I'm sure there are some questions. Do we have a microphone, please? Uh, thank you, first, for a really very nice, entertaining talk about this really important topic, which could uh, 
help save the humanity in the next few decades. Uh, so if we understand correctly that uh, 2050 is the deadline when we can expect fusion to help us uh, to cover our energy needs. I, well, it, it depends. It, uh, the, the field is now quite healthy, in fact. You can see mm -hmm. there are quite a few machines mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there is a competition and mm -hmm. competition in science is actually quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, demo should probably start around 2050, but I don't think it's going to be producing electricity because the first thing you do mm -hmm. with fusion machine, you commission them but using mm -hmm. hydrogen to find mm -hmm. all the design faults so if you can repair them before machine is activated. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you use robotics, of course, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. everything will be on ITER, will be done with, mm -hmm. with robotics, and most of the shutdowns on JET will be done with robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, other programs might be, f might be faster, in fact. The one in the United States, Spark, is actually a small machine, which is only about 200 megawatts of fusion mm -hmm. power, but it's a very compact mm -hmm. uh, tokamak with very high uh, magnetic fields, and it's using uh, mm -hmm. high temperature superconductors, mm -hmm. so it's actually quite innovative. Mm -hmm. And considering, uh, and it's also private investment, so considering that uh, it's not going to cost that more, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised that that one is first. Mm -hmm. uh, that was I actually my next question. I have yes. to be objective, in uh, fact. I yes. have to be okay, but I mean, my feeling is that my, maybe smaller machine will, will come there first. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I would still like to add one. Uh, you preemptively answered my next question, which was the alternative approaches like Spark at MIT, but there are others like, uh, I mean, HB11, like the boron approach, or maybe helium, where they use helium-3 and they don't get any neutrons and they might even there, be faster. There are many right? things happening, in fact. In Oxfordshire, there are two, two comp private companies which are dealing with fusion. One is Tokamak Energy, which deals with Tokamak. Another, Tokamak, another one is First Light, which actually uses completely different method. And the Canadian company, General Fusion, is building another machine on our side starting this year mm -hmm. uh, because the jet is stopping next year, but infrastructure is still there, so it's actually quite a useful place to build something new. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is wonderful. So let's hope for the best. We can take one more short question. Just like, yeah, please. Can you say, can you say could you say a word on uh, uh, inertial fusion with uh, lasers? Well, they are making good progress as well. In fact, they they have the record uh, of uh, max maximum fusion power, which is 0.7. Actually, it's only 0 0.03 higher than ours. But uh, they are making the progress. Uh, but to be honest, uh, in in the last two years, I was involved so much in the jet projects, so I actually didn't follow what's happening. It was very hard, in fact, to run a uh, DT experiment during lockdown with only about 12 people in a, in a control room which normally holds about 60. And I was managing operation from home for about two months. <laughs> so we have a lot of practice with Zoom and Microsoft Teams and WebEx and whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, that's our new world for most of us. So we go to our next eminent speaker with, I think, more immediate challenge is 100% <laughs> renewables possible. Uh, Ugo Bardi, as you know, is a member of the Club of Rome. He's also the professor of chemistry at the University of Florence. And let me also mention uh, founding president of the Peak of Oil that might be relevant in the 100% uh, renewables. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here, which I think you may be interested in what I'm going to tell you because for this winter, we may be facing uh, some kind of a problem, as you all know. And the problem is even more difficult than it seems to be in this slide, because these ancient oil lamps used to be fueled with whale oil. And we don't have any more whales, by the way, so we can't even go back to oil lamps. So the question is, what do we do? And people speak of the energy transition. And I can give you, ladies and gentlemen, good news. We can make it. Not everybody knows, but let me show you the latest result. Mm -hmm. Okay, there it goes. And uh, it's really, it is very simple. This is not basic science. This is uh, technology. And you see how incredibly fast the cost of solar panels has gone down. And uh, it's now there is, uh, you know, people used to speak about alternative energy. Not anymore. 
there is no more solar energy is no more alternative it is the energy all the others are alternative energy and it is very good you know that solar panels the photovoltaic panels is a technology which was the initial the origins go back to the 1930s to almost a century ago over one century the technology went through a learning cu curve which is leading it now to be very very inexpensive which is extremely good for us unless of course you prefer stay in the dark and in the cold but i think we all welcome this development um of course i know what you're thinking after you give talks you can read the minds of your, your audience you know i'm reading your minds right now you're asking yourselves and to me and how about the infrastructure how about the materials how about the difficult it is true we need storage we need materials we need to redo the whole power grid that's going to be expensive but we can still do it it's it's possible you go for the cheapest thing you have and then you expand but the question is not easy to understand and we need more than just the prices we need a model can we make it in time supposing that our supply of fossil fuels is cut this winter might it happen hopefully not because we cannot make it by this winter no way so the question is how long could it take for this transition to go all the way to a near 100 percent of supply from renewable energy and that a basic science question we need models we cannot just say oh it is some, some people do oh it's so cheap all problems are solved no absolutely no let me go back to something that you have already seen at the beginning of this um, meeting and is the limits to growth 1972 this is a model of our future how it was seen in 1972 and you can notice that uh, um, the eventual result of certain tendencies that we all die because that's what the model says if we don't change some parameters of the model by 2050 we are all died a few of, our, of us will be but um, hopefully <laughs> not a whole humankind and uh, this model had as input what were the best knowledge the best data the best technologies of the time there was no renewable energy so we need now to redo this model taking into account that we have this new cheap source of energy but uh, before going straight into that just let me explain a little bit two minutes how the model works because not everybody believes in models and uh, you are correct i still reading your minds to say how does it work why these curves uh, well there is a reason but you see that um, if you ever worked with code you programmed something that you see that this is the thing not to do this is the scheme of the model of the limits to growth of 1972 so you, you are justified and say this is rubbish but it is not but it looks like rubbish because at that time uh, they didn't really have uh, they haven't learned the way to explain to um, justify and to systematize their work that's uh, they, well, the best they could do with this i said it's complicated we know but please trust us now it didn't work We're still fighting this idea that it was a scam um, um, some, something that never could but you there is a logic trust me for the beginning <laughs> there is a logic in this thing the first thing we can do is to simplify it and to um, understand it in terms of blocks of elements still this one is much better but still you don't understand why so what what's going on why what is flowing in this diagram why do we from this diagram you see those bell-shaped curves we need to go further this is already one step in the right direction but we need to understand that the model of the limits to grow just like all good models was based on thermodynamics and in particular on the dissipation of energy potential 
this system has a flow. It doesn't appear here, but there is a direction. It goes in a certain direction. You have, it's flowing from natural resources and agriculture into population investments and pollution. There is a flow in a certain direction. And by the way, this is something that was clarified in the 1950s by Ilya Prigogin, who was incidentally a member of the Club of Rome. But you may wish to read this book, it's from the 90s, it's extremely interesting and it tells you in general that everything that happens anywhere, everywhere, anytime, it happens because somebody, something, some entity is dissipating a thermodynamic potential. You, you are doing that right now. Not dissipating the thermodynamic potential. Just relax two minutes. This is Feng Shui. And you see the water flowing. Why do we find this relaxing? Because we are seeing a potential being relaxed. Now, we know this is a gravitational potential. And uh, we see it being dissipated. Water goes down, doesn't, does not go up. Um, would be a little strange if it were to do that, but uh, now that you, you feel relaxed, right? You feel better sir, looking at this. And, but let me show you something a little, le a little less um, relaxing, a little more upsetting, just to note, quick note, that uh, the depletion or politics is not the only problem we have with fossil fuels. As in this graph that was created by Gorshkov and Makarieva, by the way, we have one of the authors in our uh, listening to this talk, and uh, shows you that we're living in a rather precarious condition. Um, really, the Earth would be stable at about 600 degrees Kelvin, which I'm sure most of you would find rather unpleasant. And uh, with the risk, is that, you see, we are in a small potential dip separated by a potential barrier. And we, if we exaggerate in pushing the system, we may roll down all the way to, this written in Italian, Inferno Terra. I, think, I guess you understand what I mean, hell, earth. And um, so we have to go through this transition. We absolutely need to stop using fossil fuels. Not enough, we need more, but as a first step, if we don't have energy, we cannot do anything because our job every day, what we do is dissipate thermodynamic potentials. So we create models about the dissipation of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, energy sources, which I know that is not uh, technical, is not correct to see that it's a source, but uh, fossil fuel is a um, entity which gives you, gives us entropy to dissipate. And this is a typical, very simplified model. Professor Matsumoto, you might recognize, um, Professor Matsumoto is a little bit um, silent now. Matsumoto sensei, no, okay. <laughs> this is essentially a very simple model, which those of you who are um, into molecular, into bio, biology of populations, you may recognize it is very similar to a classic model, which is a Locke Volterra model, which was the first um, uh, system dynamics model in history. So it's, it's really the basic idea is simple. Then you can add complexity, of course, but what you have essentially when you have a chain of dissipating stocks that goes like, like a fountain, you know, like, like the, the um, waterfall that I showed before. You go with getting this curve. You fill up a reservoir, then it empties out, and then you get, and then you get another, and then another, and then another. And if you start with a finite resource, a non-renewable resource that you cannot replace, then, then it's over. After a certain time, everybody dies, which is why we want renewable energy. And going back to this, you see these curves. So the model is much more complicated than this very simple model, but the result is the same. You have things that go up and down, and, uh, and you dissipate gradually your potential down, down, down. And now we have to add the renewable energy. Okay, you're happy with this. I, I know that uh, Professor Matsumoto, you will recognize this as two Lotka Volterra uh, systems 
coupled. It is a little like your two competitors in, uh, in, econ in an economic system, but this is one of these is a, a competitor which has only a limited capability to produce because it uses no renewable energy. So it is going to lose the competition. But then you have uh, two waterfalls. One is renewable, the other is uh, fossil, and then you go down and eventually one will win. And you can uh, say for this, you can uh, try the model without renewable energy and you get again the same result. Everybody dies, and um, unfortunately, um, the model, uh, it's just a model, not, not reality. And what you do, you add renewable energy and then you have this curve, you see? how it changes. It is it's a very simple model, it's, um, specific. it is made simple in such a way that you can understand how it works, but it falsifies this older model because here there was no such a thing as a rebound because there were no renewable energy. At that time in 1972 it, it was impossible to think, even to, to dream that the renewable energy could have led us to this result. So, how long does it take? This model is very simple. I see here that uh, we're talking about 50 years. You can, uh, in, when I have time, I show to the, to the audience the real model. We can, we can go like an accordion. A lot of time, little time, depends on how eff efficient is the technology and it depends on how much you want to invest in the new to abandon the old. So we can do much better than this. This is a um, calculation. This is not a simple model. This is a detailed model that takes into account a lot of factors, the economy, the population, the different technologies. And, and um, it was done in 2016. And you see, we were discussing about something like like replacing completely fossil fuels uh, in about 20 years, which is more than 20 years, more, more like 40 years. And this is the order of magnitude that we are dealing with decades. We cannot make it faster than that in some assumption because in 2016 already the situation was different. Now it is much better. And just one last calculation from the latest report of the Club of Rome, Earth for All, you see that uh, if we are willing to push a lot of resources into the transition, then we can make it by 2050, more or less. 2050, it's called the giant leap here. And then you notice this is a little different. It goes down after the peak because the system has many more parameters and then it is assumed that the population stabilizes. Actually, it goes down gradually because of the, the, the demographic transition and you at some moment you becoming more efficient so you don't need so much energy so you go like this but eventually it will stabilize uh, providing abundant and cheap energy for everybody provided that we want to do this which is uh, not at all obvious that we we really want this because if you, if you try to push this idea, you find a lot of opposition, bureaucracy, the government, the people who still reason with the date of, of last century. So, uh, people say, will tell you, wow, we need nuclear, there is no other way, but I show you that the nuclear right now is five times more expensive than solar. Natural gas, just two times more expensive, but now natural gas is 10 times more expensive than solar. And uh, five, minutes. five minutes, yeah. I'm, getting to the end, and the beauty of this, it's beautiful, I love this idea, it's a miracle, ladies and gentlemen, when I used to speak about climate change, uh, resource consumption, resource depletion, and people would look at me and say, what do we do? And uh, the only thing I could tell them uh, five or 10 years ago, ah, well, uh, take a bicycle, use a public transportation, put a double pane glass, and they were looking at me, well, is this? the solution but now i can tell you we have a solution we have we can have energy people are enthusiastic say, but i can't put panels on my on my roof yes you can if your bureaucrats 
let you do that because the bureaucrats don't want you to be independent. They want to, you and the lobbies and all this. So anyway, and just as uh, even more optimistic, I'm already enough optimistic. You know the Club of Rome is supposed to be pessimistic, catastrophistic. Um, we are not showing the same figure that uh, Neboiza showed on the first day. 13 years to go from horse-drawn carriages to cars. 13 years. You can make it. Not this year, not next year. But if we really wanted it, we could make it in about 20 years. 15, maybe. So we can do it. We don't need to starve, uh, freeze, um, in general, die. And uh, this is what we are, we are discussing this in uh, this blog that you may wish to um, take a look at. And uh, just to finish with the philosophical note, what we're doing it here, we're discussing about philosophy and about Seneca. And uh, I think what we, is happening something, but never every success, Seneca said, is the result of a past failure. Because failures are this thing good, which make you learn. And it's no doubt we are learning a lot of things, but we can go back and, and uh, there also this blog about Seneca, if you like. <laughs> this is more philosophical, and, but I enjoy publishing musings on this, on this um, blog. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you also for saving us quite a lot of time. Thanks a lot. So I'm sure there are some questions. Please. Thank you for the enlightening presentation. Uh, among the challenges, you mentioned storage. And we know uh, short-term storage is kind of uh, okay, expensive but easy. But what about the long-term storage? What do you think about solutions like a globally interconnected grid or maybe solar power stations in the Earth's orbit or in the deserts? Or maybe you have some better solutions? Uh, I'm not sure I caught. What is the question exactly? The question is about long-term energy storage from summer to winter. The next winter? Uh, this winter, not next. I mean, now in summer we have a lot of energy. From yes. Solar. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. And, yes but in the winter, you, so how do you this, this, this winter will be. Uh, I was thinking this. This winter will be will be hard in Europe. I know. And uh, you're right, especially you know, if you have. I had panels on the roof of my home. When it snows, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to produce energy. So it's um, what we call the smart grid, and uh, we try to use um, to adapt the grid in such a way to provide the minimum energy that we need or in winter we have to reduce our consumption because solar um, panels do not produ produce so much. And, um, but anyway, I can tell you that uh, storage is, uh, the cost of storage is going down following the same learning curve as you saw at the beginning. And it is, it is really falling up. And I mm -hmm. can tell you that I am mm -hmm. buying from, uh, from a friend a um, storage system of 10 kilowatt hours for my home, True. which could give me at least three days of autonomy, yes. even in uh, case of a breakout. And it costs yes. a few thousand euros, yes. not, not so expensive. Uh, it, yes, just a sub question. I mean, until winter, we have like 200 days, which means that uh, ideas like globally interconnected, grid, there is sun yes. or summer uh, somewhere in the earth. So what do you think about that? And you can, that you can move energy over thousands of kilometers. This electric power can be moved with reasonably reasonable losses over at least 2,000 mm -hmm. kilometers. Mm -hmm. It is done in mm -hmm. Brazil, for instance. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a big mm -hmm. dam, and mm -hmm. uh, the energy goes to Sao Paulo mm -hmm. over, I think, mm -hmm. 1,500 kilometers. It yeah. is possible. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, what uh, worries me in those calculations is that there's a whole group of actors, you know, that really work in the other direction. And if you look at the projected investment in new fossil fuel, uh, uh, you know, s uh, search, uh, all, all searches and, and also um, uh, infrastructure, it's in the trillions for the next 20, 30 years that we're talking about here. And yeah, well, it's uh, kind of difficult to see how we can stop that very powerful uh, 
uh, in the stream? Good question. I, I um, confess that I don't have the answer. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you have better ideas than me, but it is, it is indeed very difficult. We are facing this big, big, big problem. At all levels of the of decisional levels, uh, the top levels don't know, the middle levels have no idea. Even ordinary people, they don't, they don't know this revolution. They have this possibility. They still reason, as I said, with data from last century. And, but but it is, I think it is moving. If you follow the debate, there is a typical stance of uh, the green, the pure green. He said, no, we don't want renewable energy. We want to stay in the dark. And <laughs> at the beginning, they were the majority. I have a feeling that there is a shift. Some people say, what are you say, you, you numbskull, silly douchebag or whatever? <laughs> We want energy, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll have it, and I'm just moving. Yeah, if I may comment on that, uh, the, the peak year investment in the new renewables was 2017 with, with about 300 some billion in the world, but I just looked recently at Trend 21, and this year is significantly more, about 350 billion. So things are happening. Uh, we need investments everywhere, otherwise we will not solve this equation. Yeah. So thank you very much. Now we come to our third contribution, I think another very important topic on how to measure and monitor air pollution. Uh, Marina Frontasaeva is the head of the Department of Neutron Activation Analysis and Applied Research and she's also associate professor at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubina. So the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to be in the group of celebrities, participants of this conference, and I'm grateful to Professor Neskovich for giving me the floor to speak about air pollution in Europe. I represent the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, its international intergovernmental organization under the roof of the United Nations. And in 2014, coordination of this program under the head of the United Nations came to, from UK to Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. The reason is simple, because you see the member states are Eastern Europe, which was not well involved in the program, which mostly was active in uh, uh, Western Europe. But what's happened uh, due to the known events? You see these countries in blue, they, inter uh, they interrupted their participation in the program connected with the Joint Institute, because on the base of the Joint Institute at the Plow Cloud platform, I shall speak more detail later, a good program, data management system was created where all countries, it's four countries, 40 countries of the Europe and some countries of even Asia, contributed their results. But nowadays, the most probably, they will not provide results for Russian Federation. And <coughs> we shall see what will happen so far. We are under the roof of the United Nations. We shall see how it will go on further on. A few words about this program. This program is under convention on long-range transboundary air pollution by Economic, not Environmental, Commission of Europe. Because this commission decides who should pay contribution fees if you contaminate the environment, air have no borders, so contamination from one country, especially in small European territory, comes to another country. So money stands against it. Those countries, though the date is 2007, it didn't change greatly. You see these countries who signed that convention, and convention to the United Nations is the most powerful, say, legislation law. Uh, what this program is dealing with, air pollution, global effects, health effects, increasing greenhouse effect, climate change, definitely acid rains, well known in Europe. And the program is focused on actions to reduce air pollution, assessment, environmental pollution, continuous upgrade policy standards and guidelines. So the program reports their results to the United Nations and United Nations to the European Parliament. So uh, actions are taken under decisions of the United Nations. The next thing, picture which I liked very much, because at one glance you can see who contaminates the earth most of all. Duck is the highest concentration, the rest you understand. So China, India contribute to the most global problem of air pollution. The next picture, deaths from urban air pollution. Where are duck spots? You see them here. What's also important, COVID, which tortured us for a certain period of time, 
it's really demonstrate that atmospheric the atmosphere, um, aerosol contamination is responsible. Where it's most contaminated area, where COVID was most stressful. Look at these pictures. And you see, um, you see this, um, okay. <coughs> China again, and uh, the uh, Europe and the American continent are affected by COVID in most contaminated. That means COVID was most severe there. The next picture, just very simple, it shows this rotation of this, uh, first of all, pollution sources, rotation, and the position coming from atmosphere, which we, uh, con which we, re we, con which we store and analyze. Few words about history. The word of MOS may be not very known to most of you fundamental physicists. By monitoring survey using mosses. Mosses are simple plants, which are used for, they have no roots, and uh, that's why everything which comes on them serves them as uh, their nutrition and they reflect the position of contaminants. That program was initiated by Scandinavian scientists with most of them, with three of them. We had strong collaboration for many, many years. And Harry Harmas was the previous coordinator of this program. Coordination from his hands came to my hands because for 20 years we contributed to that program. And moreover, from the Joint Institute, 13 countries were brought to this program. So the mosses is a simple plants, which I told you. There are specific plants which have very distinct segments. It's, imposs it's possible to take three upper segments, which will reflect contamination accumulated by these plants for the uh, last three, four years. So uh, there is a variety of plants which are growing, say, in the northern hemisphere practically everywhere. For that reason, I expect that three persons whom I met here from uh, Pakistan, from uh, Japan, from Congo, maybe they would like to join us in that program. So every time when I have possibility to speak about that program, I do. So I invite people because the importance of air pollution is obvious. Without food, we live one month without water one week and without air five minutes. So in doctrines of all developed countries, doctrine, I mean safety doctrines, uh, air pollution stands on the first place in terms of attention of the government. So most is just pictures to show to you. I have no possibility to collect it somewhere here to show you it in, in say in hand to show you. This is the picture showing how people collect mosses in Leningrad region where the whole carpet of mosses because it's quite wet territory. And the teacher of school, sometimes in joint institute we have schools for teachers. Teachers come and they address to the audience inviting them to the program. They come from different parts of Russian Federation. So I formed 15 groups in Russia who provided us with most samples and then we analyze them using most powerful analytical technique, neutron activation analysis at our reactor. Thus, we help people not only in Russia, but also in some member states which provide us with samples, in particular with Serbia. Uh, here is my friend, uh, whom I'm very grateful for coming, Milica Tomashevich. She wrote me a letter 20 years ago saying, we would like to collaborate with you. And they say, why not? And so we started collaboration. And nowadays, for more than 25 why 25 years I collaborate with Serbian scientists. You will see some examples in the end of my presentation. So convention moved from UK to Russia on one hand because United Nations, they were interested in central, in the Caucasus, <coughs> Central Asia and Southeastern Europe. And our institute had member states. It was easy for me to get grants and to provide certain support for those countries who contributed their results to our program in the frame of the activity of the Joint Institute. So the program came to Joint Institute, as I told in 14, and you see here is the list of uh, program surveys in Europe. Every five years, most survey is announced all over European countries. Nowadays, some Asian countries even joined us, and that is my perspective to work with Asian countries later on. It started, say, in the late 60s, and uh, you may notice here 2015, the first most survey in 2015-16, when 36 countries participated, was conducted under the roof of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. Now we are carrying out survey 2020-21 and prolonged it for 22 because of COVID. But still, there are many enthusiastic people who even collected samples during this hard period. 
and you will see the final result. The interest of the society to this program is shown in that picture. There are two graphs and one so number of the countries and number of the participants. And so you see it growing. In the beginning, when that program was officially announced by the United Nations, only 22 countries participated. Now it's just 30 and even more, up to 40. It varies from, day, from time to time, depending on different programs. So the importance of this uh, work is highly appreciated by the parliaments of the countries, and they just uh, support this uh, re research. That is just a picture showing one of the meetings annually we meet in any countries who participate in the program. That is a picture from 16, which was carried out in Joint Institute, and you see how many countries there. And among them, those countries, which before were not participating in the program, but due to contact with the Joint Institute, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, Kazakhstan, they were introduced and reported results to the program. That is just very brief to show you lead. Lead, you know, the environmental poison element. Lead, situation in 1990, 15 later, situation was improved. And in some sense, we contributed, the program contributed to this fact because we reported result and some measures on improvement of situation. For example, uh, the purification of air emissions, one hand, as for lead, uh, forbidden leaded gasoline. Gasoline provided contamination of lead. You see in that upper picture, you see red spots for lead. And look, 15 years later, situation is improved because leaded gasoline was forbidden in, uh, in the European Union countries, in the Europe countries at that time. Well, next picture shows you the books, which I'm very proud of. Our first contribution was that green upper picture. We found enthusiasts who collected mosses in Romania. They brought them to Dubna, we analyzed, and we reported first results. Then other countries joined. And finally, 25 years after that, the last book, which you see in the picture, um, it was uh, edited in Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. Results were collected, and we reported to the United Nations with this report and the uh, Economic Commission highly appreciated the final outcome of this result. That is the book where our names are depicted as Joint Institute. For your better understanding, first the program was interested in heavy metals, then nitrogen appeared, so far it was possible analyzing samples for heavy metals, for example, it was possible also to analyze for nitrogen. Nitrogen is important for agriculture. Then, of course, in 2010, pesticide organic pollutants, persistent organic pollutants, become most fashionable, say, top of research. But unfortunately, not many countries can analyze this organic pollutants because it's very expensive. One sample is 200 euro at least. Then radionuclides, about the role of radionuclides using mosses. It was well known before. In the 90s, people after the Kishtim uh, catastrophe in the Ural and in parallel in the UK, in uh, uh, their, say, facility, nuclear facility, mosses were used as biomonitors as well. So it was well known, but not introduced in the program. And starting from 2015, radionuclides also are used in that. And my dream also to switch to cosmic dust. Cosmic dust, we know, it appears, and mosses, they trap these particles. No time to speak more about that topic, but it exists, and you may believe me that it will be in the future included as well in the program. So that is say, the role of the Joint Institute. You see a lot of countries, not, some, not all of them are member states, but we still accept their results and for free analyze their samples because that is our contribution of international organization to that program of the United Nations. Here you see the list of the countries. Red are those who are not member states, but we collaborate with them, we analyze their samples and results were reported to the United Nations. Above only God, as I joke. We use our facility regatta, just a couple of words. It's a nuclear reactor in Joint Institute. We have facility with poetical name, regatta, Russian European Gate to Asia or, Asia, or Africa, it depends where I give a talk. Well, uh, this is uh, the way how we prepare samples. Mosses is concentrated in uh, that small pellet. Then this pellet is packed either in aluminum foil for long irradiation or plastic bag for short irradiation. And we determine the whole periodic table. What's important to notice, due to 
uh, a large organization because we have analytical possibilities in our laboratory, Newton activation analysis. We have laboratory information technologies who help us to create program which exists on the cloud platform and countries can contribute their results. It was highly appreciated by the Secretariat of the United Nations because it allows at one, say we press the button and we see the map distribution of contaminants for the whole data because every sampling site has coordinates so it's very easy to use uh, the result of the analysis and correlate it with coordination. So that is the team who created that program and it was also appreciated. And prospectively, in perspective, we uh, suppose not only demonstrate results of contamination, but also to combine information with pollution sources, with different things which could allow to interpret data. Neural network will be used, which is widely used in many other branches of science. So these are the requested list of elements which you see, including nitrogen. But um, uh, this picture shows, for example, most of the 15, 40, 16, which I showed you the picture of the report. And you see how many uh, sampling sites were collected. It's 5,000 samples. Uh, that is more, say, visible way. Uh, for example, Scandinavia, they contribute a lot, and you see the evenly distributed sampling, sets, uh, sampling sites. Russia is uh, represented by small territories, but what we could we do, because we don't have finance in Russia, it's just voluntary. My youngsters collect samples by, the, going by their car and collecting them to bring to Dubna and they prepare their PhDs based on that, by the way. These are the maps showing, say, cadmium, cadmium toxic elements, you know. And you see, the United States uh, Secretariat was correct to move the program to the eastern countries. Cadmium is toxic element. You see green European, Western European part, and quite contaminated uh, eastern part. And uh, so we work and demonstrate results. Chromium, chromium also is toxic elements. No time to show many. I shall probably skip some pictures just to show in that one. Here you may see the countries uh, for different, you may Marina, even find your place uh, for, for, uh, to see the place for, um, say, of your country here. Arsenic, for example, Russian Federation, more or less. Uh, antimony, uh, yeah. And you see these graphs allows to compare countries and to see where contamination and what should be done to improve the situation. This is the picture, not yet results, but only sampling sites collected for 2020, 21, 22. Red are 22 spots. You can imagine that is a live program, it develops, we communicate to the participants and we do our best. Um, so this is the list of the countries participating. You may find your own country here. Serbia is a very good contributor to that program. So for the lack of time, I can't speak much about these things, but I want to show you some pictures which demonstrate our activity, how, how accurate people work. Italy, for example, the University of Siena, you see they even tried to find the sampling site inside each square that's part of Italy. This is, say, Moscow region. Moscow region is quite contaminated territory. And my youngsters, one of them is shown here, they collected samples all over the territory before COVID and after COVID. And we saw, of course, during COVID, uh, industry diminished their emissions. But uh, we saw the difference. It's also a very important aspect of our research. Caucasus. Caucasus is an industrial country starting from the Soviet Union times. And the results were obtained here. With, which allowed us to assess the uh, contamination produced by that country because it's accumulated and due to resuspension of contamination from soil, we can determine the present day situation there. These are also North Ossetia, we collaborate these countries. Uh, North Ossetia collected wonderful Chechnya, Chechnya military activity and we really see the reasons uh, how situation was um, just uh, distorted there. Uh, well, uh, what I want to show you here, Serbia. You see, I collaborate with Serbia, as I told you, for more than 20 years. Uh, that guy uh, from the Novi Sad University, uh, Professor uh, Radnovich, it was 99, he came to Dubna, we taught him how to collect moss. He collected mosses in Serbia, and now in 2020, his son began to participate in that program. 
And now few words maybe it's interesting to the audience from Serbia. 25 years collaboration. Mira Anicic, she is the head of the laboratory. She defended her PhD under my supervision based on most analysis in Dubna, in, uh, in uh, Serbia. But analysis were done in Dubna. Very good collaboration. Miadra Krmar, professor in Novi Sad University. He was one great uh, uh, enthusiast, 2000, 2005, 11 and 15. They collected mosses in Serbia. Great collaboration indeed. I am very proud of this. Well, um, uh, what's also important for Serbian territory, for example, I want to demonstrate you real result for concrete territory. Uh, in Serbia, there is a very specific place, Bor, where copper is mined. It's very strong resource for contamination. Here, Bor, you, on the map of Serbia, you see it here. That is more detailed picture, that is bore area, where we collect this, you see the spot. At first, we didn't understand what we see. We see tremendous contamination in that part after analysis their sample. We were even curious, is it really or not? Because if you, you probably don't see, contamination here, green is 20, but red is 2,000. Can you imagine? If it's concentration five times high, it's considered like ecological stress. But here it's abnormal situation. And that story, that uh, res research was really appreciated. We published the results and we do hope to continue. Just very briefly about radionuclides. It's very important in, in, uh, in terms of Chernobyl accident and Fukushima. Let's hope no radioactivity appears even more. So we carried out our research in the framework of the program of the Atomic Energy Agency. It's a branch of the United Nations. It's a political organization. They keep an eye what is going on at the reactors of different countries. So neutron activation analysis was involved. We got grant and you see in the beginning of the uh, 2000, we started that program in Chelyabinsk region, and that is the territory where we were allowed red spots, where we were allowed to collect samples. Black, it was territory of the plant, we were not collecting, it was a special group who collects samples. And the catastrophe took place here. Here you see the tail of radioactive uh, contamination. But what we did, we uh, repeated our results and we see again this spot because cesium-137, it's half-life to uh, 302 uh, 30, uh, 32 years of uh, half-life. So 150 years should pass until contamination will decrease to more or less normal normal. So we see that spot, it's still here. And these results are very important. Besides Chernobyl, we carried out research in, many, in uh, Belarus, for example. Belarus suffered after Chernobyl uh, very much, as you know. And uh, we saw, again, quite high level because cesium, again, long-lived isotope. My idea nowadays at the Russian territory Can to carry out to research, please? yes, yeah. yes, carry out research around the atomic power plant station. There are 11 in Russian Federation, and it's very important to carry out research. For the lack of time, yes, I missed this picture, but I would like to show you um, uh, just that final uh, picture shows you the forest, and I think uh, this program will exit, and we should continue our research. Thank you very much for your attention. I had no time to tell you about my youngsters who defended their PhDs, but you may believe that the way this program is constructed, from sampling to interpreting data, it's a great field of uh, developing and teaching, training youngsters. They love this job. And I have 12 PhD students from different countries, Georgia, Macedonia, Greece, who defended their PhD, which was carried out in Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Serbia as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Great stuff. I'm sure that there are many, many things to ask, but uh, we can allow two short questions because of the heavy time constraints. If there are no questions, can I ask you just one short one? Um, much of the measurements were based with moss. Are there other plants or perhaps even filters, inanimate things that one the could problem use? The problem is just based on mosses. In principle, yes, lightings can be used, for example, or some, Microphone. Specific, Microphone. Plants, or some specific plants. But that program is focused, it has uh, very strong instruction, so similar uh, mosses should be taken into consideration, otherwise how to compare? No, that is for moss. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to move on. We have one more distinguished speaker, uh, Jin Feng Cho from China.
Um, he, he, unfortunately, he cannot be with us in person, but he has pre I understand he has pre-recorded uh, a message and then he will join us for the question period. Let me just say something about him. Um, he's the Secretary General of China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Funding in Beijing. Uh, he's also on the Executive Committee of the Club of Rome and works on a number of uh, projects with the IUCN. Uh, and I think this is a natural transition from measuring pollutants to conservation um, and e ecosystem conservation. So please roll the film. I understand it's, it's a film. Yeah. And dear distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to these great events that gathered us here to discuss about the basic sense for sustainable development, which are so important today. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jim Fung Bo from China Biodiversity Conservation in the Green Development Foundation. Our foundation, CBC GDF, was started in 1985 from Europe. A British duke returned some paradiversity back to China and donated some money set up China Paradiversity Foundation. Today, we are trying to promote the synergy between biodiversity and climate, and we focus on biodiversity and the Green Development Fund. What are basic sense? So SCI means to know. What are the basic sense we need to know today? As we all know, humans experience their primitive civilization, agricultural civilization, industry civilization, and today new civilization. Each civilization, during each civilization, we have different basic sense. That are something we must know, we need to know to survive. Those are quite different. And so we want, want to share with you what we understand are our today's basic sense for today's new civilization, because we need to start a basic sense to survive this new civilization. We also call it the eco-civilization. This morning, I received an email from Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He is talking about the Pakistan in the fight for climate justice. In his email, he shared, Past Pakistan this year is one of the worst experience the climate this year. And uh, the disaster is a natural disaster, but it's not a total natural disaster. This, especially this year's disaster in Pakistan, was caused by the industrial civilization of developed countries. We together contribute a lot to the climate, to the big changes in the weather. So that caused many disasters nationwide, including Pakistan. And this is, we think, this are the, among the basic sense of the new civilization. This is something we must know, we need to know, and we need to calculate. We need to really try to stop, decrease, release, restore all the nature. You know, this is something we call basic sense of today, of this new civilization. Another thing we want to share is uh, uh, about climate is carbon. We want to share with you is the basic sense of today is should be including we are born equal of carbon. Every individuals in the planet, on the planet, are equal of carbon. We have equal carbon rights and the carbon responsibility. This is the basic sense today. Because if we do not understand this, if we do not do all calculation based on this, we will get wrong. If we only decrease uh, the carbon emission from the during our manufacture, during our power supply, are those enough? Those are far from enough. Those are not the major part of the problem. The major part of the problem and the, the rise in the responsibility are each individuals. If we do not decrease uh, our emission through our eating, living, dressing, everything, we should care, care about our cost of carbon for surviving, for sustainable 
living on the planet. If only we change from this part, we can change our situation. For example, in China, we might, we export uh, 12 billion pets last year. The market in the whole world purchased that much. Yes, we to produce those hands, we uh, have come in mission. But if the world do not have the system to sell, to consume those hands, the common mission will decrease a lot. Even if you, you, we use clean energy, if we use clean material, with that big amount, 12 billion hands, we, we export, we manufacture, that, that is a lot of carbon. We cannot do that today. That is something we should know. Uh, climate affect biodiversity. And uh, the whole point is human-based solutions, because all the problems are caused by human, only human people, individuals, change, can give a solution, can change our today's situation from the bottom side. We have so, we have about 7.7 uh, 7 billion people on the planet, every day, closed, eating, driving, uh, refrigerated air conditioning, that are all the problem issues we need to change. It is from the China part, part the mooncake. Every year, we have over tens of billions in the industry to produce, to sell the mooncake. This is a great tradition of China, but it's not right today. With the traditional monkey, we use only one simple piece of paper to wrap up five, four kicks. And each year, we only have once or twice. But today, the packaging, the package of the mooncake are so huge, which is not, we cannot bear with that. With even clean energy, even clean, good material, we cannot, we do not have such huge resource, natural resources to waste. We need to change. Everybody needs to change from the customer and another, that is the basic sense of today. We should not, from only the new, uh, the industry civilization, they have many sense to protect the, the mooncake from uh, quality change, from shipping, from transportation. There are many reasons. They have many sense to make it such a, a monster. But that are all based on the mathematics, chemistry, physics, generally, that are industry basic sense, and not new civilizations basic sense. New civilizations basic sense, yes. We human are come equal of carbon rights. We do not, we should not waste them. We human need to contribute to our sustainable development. Another issue in Shenzhen, there is a big, project, billions, tens of billions project in Shenzhen. They're going to make a, a new channel, Georgian project, to make the bay uh, good for a big ship to go inside for tourism. That is well calculated by the industry fans and the assessment also approved, but which is not right. We criticized, we failed the litigations, we stopped this project. Because what? Because today we have very, very limited pay natural. And this is of the very few habitats for migratory birds, for marine life, for those uh, trees and uh, all those surrounding nature are very limited, are very essential today. By today's sense, we should, we must, we stop the project. That is basic sense today. Those small swallow, St. Martin's, uh, those small swallow lived on the water bank. But today, we have developed industry civilization, all major water rivers, all major rivers, uh, lakes are be uh, projected. All the banks are made by cement stones, make it uh, good for human, good look, and uh, good for human. But those birds lost their homes. And now 
those under a good uh, reason and coming to industry and civilization, those uh, projects are not right. We are trying to stop those projects to leave the nature for the little birds. If the birds lost all their homes, the pests, the bats, we, we will have only used chemicals to control. They, they are not right for the new civilization for today. We should not do all those uh, big projects. In Beijing, there is a new project called the Wetland and Forest Park. To build that park, industrialized scientists, or some, some top scientists, make the assessment, yes, they told us all the grass, the trees in these areas, are not endangered. All the fish, birds, most of the fish and birds are not endangered. So, according to their sense, this project, this wetland forest park, they give yes to the project. But after the project started, we did an assessment and a report. We told them, before the project, there are over 40, 50 kinds species of birds. After the big ecological project, there are only four to five species of birds. Why? And the, before the project, there are many uh, wild. This is wild. There are many kinds of grass and trees. Different birds eat different seeds of different uh, grass. And uh, there are many kinds of pests, bugs in this wild land. But after the construction, the project, the park, they use chemicals to control birds. They have great grassland with one single kind of grass. This is the old sense, and we need new sense. The new sense is the new civilization. Today's basic sense should be the natural is vital. We should not, we should try our best to stop, disturb the nature. In the past, uh, we, protection means uh, stop, uh, put waste to the nature. Today, protection means we should not do too much to the nature. That is today's basic facts. Uh, in Shanghai, the coastal area, we have money, we are doing planting trees project in this well coastal area, because today we are so, after this industry, industry civilization, we are so strong. We invite, they invite, top scientists to planning and then starting a big project to planting trees on the coast, on the well. This is not right according to new basic science, because this is the very few final habitats for those migratory birds from Australia, from South Africa, this is the, the final evidence for those manure and for some lives, they go from manure to they need the cost to have their babies. This is they, we have tried to stop them. The basic, the traditional sense is they make uh, endangered species, least endangered species, even uh, by cities, by using, by governments, they have the endangered species list. They want to protect them. Army. And uh, in the traditional sense, they have the state, they have to some survey, investigation, and they have some survey area called the state protected area. This is the old industry sense. But this is not correct. In the Northern Park, we have a state protected area for good bastard Asia subspecies. There are only a few hundreds of them in Asia. But during the winter, those birds fly to the south. They migrate. They do not do they fly back south. They do not know where is the state protected area. They just landed at the riverbank, at the uh, near our some villages. 
local people start to hunt them. This is by the new sense. We need to have community conservation starting in 19, uh, uh, 2016. We start conserv community conservation area for great pastor at the Henan, Changyuan. And it only is through this way, through human based solution, through all people's participation. That is the only way we can save those endangered species. We can, that's the only way we can save uh, wildlife. And starting that three, four years ago, now we have about 200 sigma nationwide in China. Through local communities, people's participation, we make a great contribution. This is the new sense we need to do. This is the only way we can protect, conserve wildlife. And today, when we should not only protect endangered species, we should protect all wildlife, and we should protect their habitat. This is new basic sense. This is some examples we did in China. The second picture is the great bus that I mentioned. Now, from few hundred, now the number goes up to few thousand after these four or five years efforts. Uh, another story, we have a Dugan protected area in the southern coastal area, near Guangxi, Alam Guangxi. But we haven't seen any of them for years. This why? Because we cannot protect the endangered species through the trying to protect them in lab, in park, in state uh, protected area. The only way we is we should protect uh, their habitats. Now we are trying to restore the habitats. We have a group of people to try to restore the habitats. Hopefully, after the habitats restored, they will come back. Biodiversity. Another new sense is biodiversity conservation in our neighborhood. To balance biodiversity conservation in sustainable livelihoods, we need, in China we have so many people, we need to live. But we, if we only protect the state, protect the area, that's far from good now. We need to protect them around uh, in our neighborhood. This is, uh, we think, uh, the new sense. How to do it? In the lotus pond, traditionally, after they collect all the seeds, after the harvest, they will clean the pond. They will use chemicals. They will make it dry during the winter time to prepare next year's country. But now we ask them to start some of them, uh, according to our uh, survey, some of them, of them start a new way. They leave some water in the pumps after the harvest. Instead of use chemicals, they, they leave it as it uh, nature. And then birds comes in to eat some birds, to eat some bugs, and to see some uh, left to eat some left seeds. And they also provide fertilizer for the coming years. With this kind of activity, we call it the big biodiversity conservation in our neighborhood. During our production. We also conserve the nature. These beautiful birds are endangered listed in China. In the past, they do not have place to survive. But through this new civilization practice, they can survive in the, during the autumn, during the winter, in the past. Human left some food for them. Home, growing also have many uh, ways of according to our new sense, we should not put in, uh, use that many, that much of chemicals to protect them from bugs, from pests. We can, through nature, they have some birds, some other uh, lives to help us to control those pests, those bugs, and to get reasonable, good harvest. And with this harvest, we do not have that much chemicals left in the in our food. This is new practice. This is new sense. And uh, we need to start new sense. Instead of industrialized uh, civilization, is the complete sense of this chemical cause to control those bugs, pests, and uh, pesticides, business are growing so big. 
they are good, but they are not good enough. We need today, we need to consider more about a natural based solution here. Today, we want to share with you and uh, we also want to exchange ideas and learn from you. Hopefully, later we can get some feedback, some criticism, some advice to guide us through this exchange. We can get better understanding of basic science today and uh, we can better, better lead our team to involve, to participate in the sustainable development of the globe. Thank you. contribution to our session. Unfortunately, he cannot join on time. It's also very early uh, online. It's also very early in Beijing, <laughs> so it's, it's quite understandable. I think we have come to the end. The time has gone very quickly. I thought we had a really exciting session from the promise of the future energy options, fusion in the long run, renewables, let's hope over the next few decades to reduce the air pollution so when marina measures in 20, 30 years, we are going to be much more benign and environmentally oriented and also that will help for the conservation and maintaining biodiversity. So thank you very much. We